Good morning, Lighthouse Church. As you come in this morning, find yourself a seat. Let's prepare our hearts for worship so that we might praise our God who is worthy of it. I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you for this day, God. I thank you for each individual in this room. I thank you for the hearts and souls of every living being here, God. I thank you that you are with us. I thank you that you hear us, you see us, that you speak hope into our lives, God, and you give us a reason for hope. Please be with us this morning. Lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this week, we look forward to Thanksgiving, and we have a chance to reflect on all the ways that we're blessed in this life. So, what is more, what is there to be more thankful for than the gospel? Jesus, who was both 100% man and 100% God, came, was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died a horrible death on the cross that was reserved and deserved by you and I. And he now stands with the Father and offers his life and death in place of ours so that we might one day have eternal life with him. But this morning we're going to sing about several songs that reflect that. We're going to sing about the fact that not only has he already come once, but he will come again. We have been shown amazing grace, which leads us to run to the Father. And not only are we saved from eternal separation, but even now we're being resurrected to new life in Christ that changes us from the inside out. So with that, I'm going to have Zach read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into the inheritance that we can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, for, who th for through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that was ready to be reviewed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Please stand with us while we worship and sing. All right, you may have to take your seat. And I will be doing some more talking as I share a ministry minute about our worship team. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brandon. And I currently oversee the worship team here at the Lighthouse Church. Today, I want to share a little bit about our team and ways that you may be able to get involved if you're interested. First, let me start by explaining that our worship team is actually made up of three different teams. There is the sight, sound, and praise team. And each of these teams operates in a unique fashion in helping to lead worship here at the church. So I'm going to take a minute to share a little bit about how each of these parts function and what their roles are. The first team is the site team. The, <laughs> the opening lines of scripture tell us in Genesis 1, 1 through 4, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. The site team is responsible for the lighting on stage and the visuals on screen. We believe that God has blessed us with light as an opportunity to see his majesty and the creation that he's revealed to us. And Pastor Caleb taught about this last week from Psalm 19. The second team is the sound team. Without them, communicating audibly would be much more difficult. So, can you hear me? Do you like doing this? Probably not. So, we take this mission seriously because we believe what Romans 10, 13 through 14 says. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one, who, the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Now, Pastor Gary is responsible for the preaching. However, the sound team is responsible for making sure that his message is heard clearly. They're also responsible for making sure that the music 
videos, and other guest speakers are heard clearly from the stage in a way that can be easily understood. That brings us to the third portion of the worship team, which is the praise team, who was just on stage. This is the team that comes up and leads music as a form of worship during our service. And so why do we play music for worship? Well, I'm glad you asked. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness, praise him with sounding, of the trumpet, praise him with the harp and the lyre, praise him with timbrel and dancing, praise him with strings and pipe, praise him with the clash of cymbals, praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We praise the Lord through song because it's in our nature to do so as Christians. It's an outward expression of an inward belief that the God we serve is worthy of praise. As a team, we have the unique privilege in not only singing and worshiping ourselves, but leading others in worship. And this is the worship that God so greatly deserves. However, it's important that we recognize that worship is much more than lights, it's more than noise, it's more than music. John 4, 23 through 24 says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. So then how do we do that? And what is the true purpose of this worship team? Well, I believe it's pretty simple, and it can be visualized by a painting by Matthias Grunwald called the Eisenheim Altarpiece. Specifically, there's a portion of this painting in the bottom left corner that includes, or that side, I'm sorry the hand of John the Baptist. We get to be involved in one of the greatest parts of ministry as followers of Christ in that we get to directly point people to Jesus. John 1, 35 through 37 says, the next day, John, this is John the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. We get to come up here and share the gospel, and we get to present and highlight the beauty of God's creation. We also get to edify and encourage other believers to focus and to refocus on the source of our hope and our faith. It's, it's an amazing way that we get to use some of the talents that God has blessed us with to give back and to serve him and to serve one another. And to remind ourselves and each of you of how great he is and always will be. So, with all that said, if you are interested in learning more about our team, or if you're interested in being a part of our team as a musician um, who wants to celebrate the skills that God has given you and come up on stage and play and lead worship, or as someone who's more technically driven and who would like to learn more about the sound and visuals of what we do, I would encourage you to come speak to one of our team members. Uh, one of us will be out in the hallway after this, the message, and uh, we would love to connect with you and find ways for you to get involved. So thank you. All righty, before Pastor Gary starts, I have just a few announcements. Uh, the first one, if you drink coffee on Sunday morning, I encourage you not to get coffee on your way in next week, but get it here. You'll find more information about that uh, next weekend, but I promise you, we're going to have coffee, and our youth are going to be running it. Um, and they'll, again, they'll explain more about that next week, but skip the coffee, get it here. Uh, December 7th uh, is a Saturday. There's no service here that night because we are going out into the community, and we are participating in the West Cape May Christmas Parade. So we encourage you, if you uh, don't want to be on our float, um, to invite somebody else out to the Christmas parade or go do something with somebody um, to be a light to them, to be a light in the community. If you do want to be involved, contact me after service or sometime this week so we can make sure you have all of the information necessary to be a part of that night. And lastly, if you are new or newer to the Lighthouse Church, we want to invite you out to our Connection Cafe on December 8th, directly after service, uh, just a time to get to know the staff, to get to know the mission of the Lighthouse Church, and to find out what your next steps are here. Um, so if you are newer, 
uh, you can meet, go out into the lobby after service and at the welcome counter there is a card to invite you to that um, as well as a way to register. If you've been here for a while and you've seen somebody um, that maybe that might be newer, I encourage you to encourage them to go. They might need that extra shove, so this is a, um, a good time to encourage that, to encourage fellowship. You might find out some information about the staff that even people who've been here for a while might not know, like who is a BMX champion or who's held the javelin record at their school for 13 years. It's a fun, a fun time. We won't keep you too long, but we do want to be able to connect with you. We're going to be in Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Jesus, name above all other name, worthy of all the songs we could ever sing. Under no other name is salvation found, Jesus, the indescribable gift. Lord, we come before you today as a people that are longing. Lord, we sing songs about being set free. Lord, we are a people that are in desperate need of freedom. I thank you for the indescribable gift of Jesus. I thank you that Jesus was and is a demonstration of your profound love for us, your creation. I thank you for creating us in your image and desiring a relationship with us. Lord, I thank you for how amazing you are in your deliberate and intentional ways, powerful ways that you are revealing yourself to us. I think about the gift of Jesus. I think about the gift of your creation, which is a gentle whisper, the outer fringes of who you are. I thank you for the gift it is today to have your word. It's every word is flawless, it's living and active. Lord, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that for those of us that walk with you through Jesus, we have the same power that conquers the grave, powerfully moving through us. Your desire through the gift of your word and the power of the Holy Spirit is to transform this wretched man into a saint that's now saved by grace. And so thank you, Lord, because I have grieved the Holy Spirit. I have leaned on my own understandings. I have been rebellious and stiff-necked and obstinate, but I thank you in the midst of this journey, your gentleness and patience and compassion and grace and mercy and abounding love has been almost unbelievable. It's that amazing. A reflection of your greatness. Lord, today would you continue through word, your word, to open up our eyes in wonder to how great and awesome you are and the depth of your love for us. Lord, I pray as we open your word that your truth would go forth, that your Holy Spirit would stir in ways that are unmistakably you, that you would reveal, that you would call. I think about the souls not just in this room, but every soul, child alike, in this building that would leave this building different, not again because I have any profound words to say, but because your word is truth and it's the truth that sets us free. You know the details and needs of every soul in this room. Lord, if there's anybody in this room or in this building that needs to come to you or return to you, that you would call and we'd repent, that you would enable us to come to you in the name of Jesus. Under no other name is salvation found. And for those of us that believe today that you would use this time to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we would leave here in wonder and awe that you are an awesome God. Lord, we pray that this time is honoring, glorifying, and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name. How did you sleep last night? What's your relationship like with sleep? Would you consider yourself a good sleeper? One who wakes up often? One who has trouble falling to sleep? Staying to sleep? What's your relationship like with sleep? 
Over the years, I've had a tumultuous relationship with sleep. And it began in my childhood. Because I've mentioned before, I grew up in a home of addiction. And I remember my brother and I shared a room for 18 years. And I have an older sister and a younger sister. And my mom and dad also had a tumultuous relationship filled with a significant amount of conflict. So between conflict and addiction, there were on several occasions in the night when I was asleep, my mom would have to wake me up along with my siblings and we'd have to leave the house to find a safer place to go. And so when you grow up in a home where you were periodically woken in the middle of the night, sleep feels vulnerable. It didn't feel like a place that was safe for me. So much so that when I turned 18 years old, I said to my parents, I can't live here anymore. I can't live within the chaos that was going on inside of the home. And so I left the home. But what I realized when I left the home, the stuff that I was dealing with came with me. It didn't stay in the home, so I battled sleep into my young adulthood. I remember, and Debbie will attest to this, that we got married early. I was 22 years old. She was 21. And we eventually moved into an apartment in Randolph, New Jersey, about five miles from where my dad was living in the home I grew up in. And at this point in my early 20s, my mom had left my dad. My other siblings were out of the house. But periodically, when there was conflict between my dad and I, where we had a verbal altercation, I would say to Debbie, I'm not comfortable with us sleeping in our own apartment, and we would go somewhere else to sleep. And so you see how profoundly what happened in my youth stayed with me. And so I had this sort of tumultuous relationship with sleep. So much so that when I touched my first drink of alcohol at 28, I was like, oh, this works. You know what I mean by works. It took the immediate edge off and fear around and uncomfortable and tension within sleep. And I've testified that we know how that went, where the use of alcohol to self-medicate and abuse continued to spiral my life out of control until about 22-ish years ago, where I don't know if you want to define it as me being at a crossroads, but it was more like me being at the edge of a cliff, knowing that if I continued to live this lifestyle, it was going to continue down a road of complete self-destruction. But it was a time where I began to surrender or understand what to surrender to God really meant where I would allow him in to transform every fiber of my being. And not just, and obviously enormously, to reveal his love and power and presence and desire to transform all that I experienced and to transform me into the image of son, but also transform my view and experience with sleep. Because when you walk with God, it impacts every part of your journey, including sleep. This journey with God as he has been transforming me allowed me to see that sleep wasn't something to be feared, but it was a divine gift from God. You see, we're going to read in Psalm 127 that he grants sleep to those he loves. That does not mean you won't have sleepless nights. You see, the theme for today is cherish sleep. We are a people that battle sleep. About one-third of Americans say they have trouble sleeping. 50 to 70 million Americans are sleep-deprived. And about 30% of Americans have symptoms of insomnia. So we are a people, and there are a lot, or a significant amount of people in my web of influence that battle sleep. But why is that? 
when sleep is defined by God as a divine gift from God. You see that it's a gift from God and God uses it to restore and refresh and sustain. You see that God uses sleep in the Bible where he will minister to people in their sleep and he will reveal himself to people in their sleep. You will see today as we look briefly at Solomon that God revealed himself in a dream. We know though because we are people who are flesh, that we may have sleepless nights. And so my question to you today is what might cause you tension around sleep? What keeps you up at night? We know that many battles are raged in the middle of the night, at least for me. But no matter what you're navigating through today that might cause you sleepless nights, God is bigger. You see, in Psalm 127, it's a psalm that there's a debate about who wrote it, either David or Solomon. Some say David for Solomon. I'd say the majority would say Solomon. Solomon was a son that was born from David and Bathsheba. We know that David entered into an inappropriate relationship with Bathsheba. She was married to a man and he had a sexual relationship with her in which she became pregnant. We know that, long story short, David tried to resolve this many ways and finally tried to resolve it by getting rid of her husband by putting him in harm's way in battle in which he was killed. God confronted David, and as a result of their sin and her having a child, that child was taken from the earth as a consequence for their sin. David and Bathsheba stayed together, and God gave her another son, and they named him Solomon. If you don't think you can be used by God, read the story of David. Even in the midst of the depravity, God considers David a man after his own heart. And so God uses David, Solomon, to become the third king of Israel and the last king of the divided, of the united kingdom. The next king, the kingdom, will be split into two, the northern and southern kingdom. When Solomon took the throne, he was anywhere, it's estimated, we don't know the exact time, it's anywhere between the age of 12 and 20 years old. But you see as we do an introduction to Solomon to introduce the psalm, which is 127, I want to read a portion of scripture about Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3. And you see Solomon referring himself to a child in this portion of Scripture. In 1 Kings 3, verse 3, it says, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went into Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, ask whatever you want me to give you. Can you imagine being asked that question by God? He's a child. Think about it as an adult if God says to you, ask whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his, th his throne this very day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? 
The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands, as David your father did, I will give you long life. Then Solomon awoke and realized it had been a dream. Can you imagine? How big is our God? When we looked at several weeks ago the Arianic blessing, when God blesses his people, he blesses them in profound, visible ways. Why? Because what we have is ultimately always to glorify the name of God. And so when he asks for wisdom, he just doesn't give them snippets of wisdom. He makes him so wise that he says, there wasn't a king before you, and there will never be a king equal to you. How great is God? And think about, as a child, there was already wisdom from God there for him to be able to ask that question. God, give me wisdom. It also shows he understands what his role is to govern your people, your chosen people. We know that Solomon was a builder. We know that God used Solomon to build the temple. God used Solomon to build a temple that took seven years. We know that when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they had a tabernacle which was set up as they moved from place to place, and that is where God's presence would dwell. And it shows you from beginning to end that God desires to dwell intimately with his people. And so when they got into the promised land, God used him to build a temple that took seven years. He built a palace for himself that took 13 years. He built other structures, including a fleet of ships. He was the protector and builder through God, God through him, of the promised land. But we also know that along the way, he accumulated 700 wives and 300 concubines. And scripture indicates that those foreign women who worshiped foreign gods led his heart astray. And so his heart was not completely devoted. It shows that wisdom and obedience are two different things. And so when you think about Psalm 127 that was either written by David for Solomon or most believe for Solomon, you will see that it is a reminder to be careful because if God is not involved in every moment of every day, of every fiber of your being, what we tend to be about is empty. The words you will see three times in Psalm 127 is in vain. And the word in Hebrew means emptiness. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they, counted with, when they contend with their enemies in the gate. Verse 1, we're really going to focus on the first two verses of this psalm. And he says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor. What? 
in vain. The word in Hebrew, which means build, it is a word that surrounds that anything you are building, he's talking about building in a way where we're trying to build something that is stable and enduring. And so my question to us as people and Americans, what are your hands on that you're trying to build today that only God has the capability of building in a way where it's stable and enduring. Maybe it's a physical house, because the immediate context, he's talking about a physical structure. But metaphorically, he's talking about deeper. What are you trying to create or manufacture? Maybe it's not a house, but it's a home. Maybe you're just trying to build a family, and not just a family. Maybe you want the perfect family. Doesn't exist. <laughs> a family without tension and conflict. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you're spinning your wheels trying to make a relationship happen that's not of God. Maybe it's an identity. Maybe it's a career, maybe it's wealth. We are people that are known to build little kingdoms around ourselves to keep us comfortable and quite frankly, independent from God. How do you know if you're building something that you shouldn't be building? Or building something that you have your hands on that God's trying to pry your hands off? If you're involved in a relationship or something or a situation and you're afraid to take your hands off because you're afraid it's going to fall apart, that's an indication. Because what, if you're afraid to remove yourself from a certain environment or relationship or trying to do X, Y, and Z because you're afraid it's going to fall apart, it's an indication, number one, that what you're doing isn't working and that you don't have the capability to do what only God can do. You see, I believe we have a tendency to build stuff because the road that God calls us to is a road of vulnerability. You see, why I feared sleep is sleep as a child made me vulnerable. And when we as a people feel vulnerable at times, we will build something around us to protect us that's not of God. And God says here, if you're going to build stuff and I'm not in it, and I haven't told you to build it, and I'm not in it, it's empty. If you go to Genesis chapter 11, you will see an example of that. That we are a people who are obstinate, stiff-necked, stubborn, and disobedient. We should be grateful we have a God of grace and mercy. Genesis chapter 11 is a story that takes place after the flood. And I've wondered, there's a lot, I tell you, there's so much. God's word is amazing. But I wanted to know how much time took place after Noah got off the ark Right? This is after the flood, and this sort of um, situation took place. Because my question is, was Noah and his sons here during what happened? Because after Noah got off the ark in Genesis chapter 9, God says to them to increase and fill the earth. It was a direct commandment by God. But you see how quick these people and us try to divert what God is going to do and then do our own thing. In Genesis 11, verse 1, it says, Now the whole world was one language, had one language, and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if it's one people speaking the same language, they have begun to, begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, 
the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. And so you see, what does this tell us about man? And what does this tell us about God? You see that we are people who are disobedient. It's a fact. We are people that desire to settle. God told them to go. It's clear. We want to settle. We want to say, we are a people, you hear this phrase constantly, that need to put down roots. And I get what you're saying. When God places you in a place to put down roots and be all in, but if you put your roots, your roots, down so deep, are they so deep and become your roots that when God tells you to move, you won't? Because we are people that tend and like to settle. We are a people, and this is, this is a group of people that are desiring, ultimately, independence from God. Let us do our own thing, and we are quick. And that is this, why this reminder in 127 is so important, because we are people that quickly divert and do our own thing and, thinks, and think that we're the ones that are in control. But what does this tell us about God? It tells us that God is the God of grace. He didn't destroy them. It also shows that we as humans need checks and balances. But you see that he's a God of grace. How often do you take matters into your own hands? I think about the same when it comes to building. Real quick, I'm going to divert into the purpose of the church. I think we live in a country where we believe that man grows a church and not God. If you don't think that, I googled. How many books are there on church growth? I couldn't find a number, but when I googled it, it gave me the top 50 books on church growth. That's a concern to me. Now, I'm not opposed to people writing sort of books about their experience, about how God miraculously and powerfully blew through uh, their body, but I do get concerns about books that are written in a way to tell you how to grow a church. Because man doesn't grow a church, only God grows a church. The purpose of the church is to glorify God. And the growth that we should be concerned about is not so much numerical growth, but depth growth. When you look at the early church, they didn't need a book about how to grow the church because they recognized and respond to the Holy Spirit and God moved powerfully through the early church. And some of the books that you will see on the top 50 list is Desizing the Church, The Unstuck Church, Growing Young, Anatomy of a Revived Church, Future Church, Organic Church, Gospel Driven Church, Intentional Church, Comeback Church, Purpose Driven Church, Move the Disappearing Church. How come Bible's not on that list? You see, we can't... I believe even as a church, we can become quick to put our hands in places where only God's hands belong. And it's not just within the church, it's within our families. It's within our day to day. So how do you recognize that? Then what is our role? What is our role? Because we have a role on this earth. Our role is to remember who God is and pray. Go to Nehemiah chapter four real quick. Nehemiah chapter four. Incredible. When you read through the Bible, Nehemiah chapter 4, you see a portion of Scripture where God uses Nehemiah. The walls of Jerusalem are in ruins. And God moves powerfully through Nehemiah to sort of lead the way to rebuild the walls. And they are going to sort of meet opposition on this journey. But you see that they realize they have a very specific role in rebuilding. Eleven times in Nehemiah, you will see him stop and pray to the living God. And he encourages the people as they're facing opposition in the rebuilding process to remember that the Lord is great and awesome. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, it says, When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their walls? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring stones back to life from these heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Amorite, who is at his side, said, what are they building? Even, if even a fox 
climbed on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O oh God. Here you see, right? There's opposition. What does he do? He prays. Hear us, O oh God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of, till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs... The Amorites and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed again. We prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is given out. There is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an, an end to our work. Then the Jews who lived near came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the peoples, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. Our role is to remember who God is and pray. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, and your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware, we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. Think about this. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his soul at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet Stayed with me. And so our role, I think, is simple. But if it's simple, why is it so complicated? Why do we revert to trying to fix things and build things ourselves when God says, pray and remember? Remember what? He is great and awesome. Psalm 127, but when you're vulnerable. Think about, when you want to think vulnerable, these people had to work with one hand and keep their weapon in the other. And so where do you go when you feel vulnerable? Quickly, as we start to wrap up, because Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stands guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. And so when you feel vulnerable, where's your faith? Quickly jump to Mark chapter 4 as we start to wrap up. It's a question that Jesus asked his disciples, a story we looked at a couple weeks ago, when he gave them an order to go to the other side of the lake, and he went to sleep, and there was a furious storm or a squall. And think about the disciples' response. When we lose our sight and take our eyes off Jesus and focus on the world, there's an issue. And it's in verse 35 and following. Verse 35 of Mark 4, he says, That day evening it came. He said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along. Just as he was in the boat, there was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to his waves, Be quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. And so when we take our eyes off Jesus and start looking at the things of the world and how they're out of control, 
They didn't go to Jesus and ask for help. They accused him of a lack of care. So he challenged them. He calmed the storm, but he said, where's your faith? Do you really believe that God is who he says he is? Jump over to Isaiah real quick, two more places, and then we'll lead into communion. Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah 52, verses 11 and 12. This is an immediate sort of prophecy, but also has future implications to the end times when he says this, depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no clean thing. Come out from it and be pure. You who carry the vessels of the Lord, but you will not leave in haste or go in flight. For the Lord will go before you and the Lord of Israel will be your rear guard. Do you believe that? Can you imagine being a church and a people and a family that walks with God in a way that we know for sure that not only is he going ahead of us, but he's got our rear guard. He has your places where you feel most vulnerable. And so where's the issue? The last portion of scripture, I believe the lack of faith and belief comes because we're sleeping in places we should be awake. And in Mark chapter 14, last portion of scripture, is when Jesus is facing agony in the garden as he's about to be nailed to a cross to cover our sin. And he says, they went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. He began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. He did not know what, he did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And so I think 38 sums it up. Watch and pray so that you will what? Not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The word temptation right there in Greek means a situation, process, or test that tests your character, faith, and endurance. You see, where do you run when the tension is thick and deep, when you're in conflict or you're anxious or you're depressed, where do you run? Because here it says to remember and pray. Remember, there's a reason Psalm 127 exists. It's a reminder that unless God is intricately and overwhelmingly involved in your day-to-day, -day. what we're doing on this earth is in vain. How much of what we do in the day-to-day -day is for the eternal and not the natural? Remember and pray. Remember what about God, that he is great and awesome, so that when you're battling the sleep in night or the tension, remember that God is great and awesome. Remember and open up God's word and see that he is for you and not against you, that he loves you. Remember, so my practical advice for you today is to always have God's word within arm length of where you sleep because you are 
are going to face battles on this journey in the middle of the night and when you go to sleep. You are going to wake up in moments where you might be attacked by the evil one and you are going to need God's word. Keep it within arm's reach and so when within arm's reach so when you feel vulnerable there's nowhere else to go. Open up God's word and say God, open up my eyes in wonder. That's how we remember who God is and his profound love for us and the promises he made. Because we need reminding over and over and over again. It is why Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, do this in remembrance of me. Because we are people who quickly take our eyes off Jesus and focus on the world. What a gift it is that we have access to the king because of Jesus. Jesus was sent by God to take our place on the cross, to lift the spirit of despair, to open the eyes of the blind, and to set you free from the captivity of the world, to enter an eternal relationship with him so that he can come in by the power of the Holy Spirit and transform you, heal you, and give you hope in the midst of the suffering, in the brokenness. He is always and will be greater than what you're dealing with today. And so on Jesus says, the Lord's Supper is an ordinance. It's something we're supposed to do as a body. It is something that we are supposed to do. It is for those that have a relationship with the living God through Jesus. It is a way to remember who God is and the demonstration of his love through Jesus. It's a way to proclaim we should be a people celebrating today that we've got hope and freedom, not because we've earned to deserve it, because our God is an awesome God, but it's also a time to examine where are the places in your heart that God is trying to do a good work to reveal his promises and truth and to set you freer from where you are today. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. As the worship team comes up, they're going to play a song of reflection. Elders and wives will be passing you out the elements of communion today. I would ask you that once you receive your elements, to reflect on God and his greatness, but also to hold them until after the song and I come up and we'll take together. Please stand as we close with one more song. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for how good you are. We thank you for your love, for your grace. Lord, we thank you that you are changing us and transforming us. We thank you for the rest that you give us, for the hope and the peace that there's so much more to look forward to. Move us, God, out of our comfort zones and lead us to where you want us to go. Be with us today. Be with each of us throughout this week. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you go out, if you need prayer, there will be individuals off to the side. Our prayer team here, they would love to pray with you, to meet with you, to hear your heart, and to take it before the Father. Have a great day.